Welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. Let us help you escape your mind. Folks, welcome back to Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. We have episode number 236 tonight, Origins of the Gods. We are joined by guest, uh, I guess he's been on four four times now, I believe, uh, Dr. Gregory Little. Uh, so looking forward to this conversation a lot. His new book, or- Origins of the Gods, is out. He is the co-author with Andrew Collins. And uh, before we get started here tonight, head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash mindescapepodcast. For just $2 a month, you'll get exclusive guest episodes and segments. Uh, we've done three Patreons with Dr. Greg on there. Uh, one including um, is a uh, slideshow of Native American Mounds. So if you're interested, check out that episode. We also have a full episode on our platforms as well. Um, and come find us on uh, Discord and chat with us on there as well. Uh, then you can head on over to our merch store, uh, as you can see the link down below, it's, uh, the link tree link. It'll take you right to the store. We've got different designs. Uh, I think they're pretty original and cool. So go check those out as you can see here. And Indra's web, um, is live. This is the social media platform we created to connect open minds. If you want to hypothesize, theorize, speculate, it's the perfect place to do it. Um, I've got big news on this end too. It's probably going to be in the app store soon. I know it's been a long time, but we're still working on that. So look for that. I will announce it on the show when it, um, is officially in the app store. So everybody can download that and, uh, start on there. And, uh, we've got the winner or I'm going to announce the winner of the mind escape t-shirt that we were, um, people were entering to win by leaving a, a uh, review on Apple or Spotify, uh this is the shirt we do have larges and mediums left if you want to enter to win and we're going to do it again next month and the people that i didn't win this month i will re-enter you to win if nobody else enters it'll just be you and anybody else that wants to enter all you have to do is go to spotify apple or google leave a five-star review take a screenshot of it and send it to mind escape podcast at gmail.com and the winner for last month is Tom, Tom Hickey. So I will send Tom a message if he's not listening, and we will get him that T-shirt. So thank you, Tom, for entering. And a shout-out to Ty, uh, Lucy, Brian, Simone, and Devon. Thank you all for entering, and uh, we appreciate that. So, uh, But without further ado, welcome back on the show, Dr. Greg. How are you? I am just fine. Uh, always a pleasure. You guys are great. Uh, hopefully Maurice will show up later. If not, that's okay. We'll see. Maurice had a little bit of a, a divergent plan. Uh, something came up at the last minute, but um, yeah, we'll try and sneak him in at the end. And uh, if not, uh, so be it. It's his loss. Okay. So. You know, you look just like you're in kind of the grand gallery of the Great <laughs> Pyramid. And yeah. a little while ago, people don't know exactly why this came up a few minutes late after, you know, it's going to start at 10. But uh, you walked through that and it looked really mystical when you went through that. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen yourself walk through it. But anyway, no, no, it's that. kind of cool. I get what you're saying, though, with like the green screen behind me. Yeah, this is from yeah. the uh, Temple of Hathor. Um, uh-huh. And I believe I have one, too, from the... Uh, both of the temples with the entrances where it looks like it has the melted stone, but it's actually just some sort of erosion. Some people speculate from water. Some people speculate just from stepping on it. Cause even if you look at the great pyramid of, uh, or the um, great wall of China, there's certain parts where so many people have stepped on it. It looks like it's been worn down kind yeah. of. So, yeah. I mean, it's hard to determine uh, what's going on with that, but yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, your new book is out origins of the gods. Um, it's as far as the audiobooks out the pay or the um uh kindle when did you say that was coming out uh the ebook it's on all the platforms kobo kindle and whatever else there is that comes out this coming tuesday which is the 19th and then may 8th is the paperback version 
Uh, I've never been involved with uh, a, a book that was scattered this way that, you know, it was uh, the audio came out a couple of weeks ago, then the ebook, then the paper book, but it's all supply chain stuff. Uh, they have to get books to all the stores. They got to get them to England. They're not getting over to, they're already printed and they're in warehouses, but they're not getting over to England till sometime in July. That's how long it's going to take to wow. arrange a ship a ship container and all that to get them over. So uh, it's just supply issues. Well, I mean, I do both. I read books, obviously. I have a whole stack, little library going, but I also like listening to the audio books too. So I listen to a lot of podcasts as well. Uh, but I, yeah, I enjoy your, your audio book. I, I've listened to your part. I still have to listen to Andrew's part, but I thoroughly enjoyed your portion of it. And that's kind of how you guys write these books, right? Uh, when you co-author yeah. them, you, you split it up, you write the first half or the second half and he does the other half kind of a thing, right? That's right. This is it. Uh, the, the, the paperbacks are, like I said, they're in the warehouse. So they have sent some to the authors and some reviewers and all that. But uh, yeah, Andrew and I split it up. We have pretty much the same ideas. Uh, Andrew goes into a lot of physics and like quantum mechanics. I do not go into that. Uh, that's kind of how he ends the book. But I, my first half is really about Native American beliefs and UFOs, aliens and um, the ancient astronaut theory. And then I take it into shamanism and say that shamanism is a lot older than anybody believes. And then Andrew starts his half by going to a cave in Israel where a, a number of ritualistic items have been found indicating that shamanism took place there as long ago as 400,000 years. So we're, we're talking about uh, something that's been around a long, long time. So the two halves are very different, but they both kind of say the same thing. Yeah, and I really appreciate, obviously we talk a lot about fringe and metaphysical things on this podcast, but I really appreciate your take because you're a psychologist too, so you understand the mind and kind of how the mind works. Not that anybody fully understands the mind, but yeah, um, no you know, we, we all try our best, right? But uh, you have yeah. a, a good approach where um, you're not very dogmatic and you're open to new interpretations, but yet you have your own hypotheses that kind of play off of, you know, like Young or um, Keel or these different uh, guys that kind of had an interesting take and spin on things. So I really appreciate that about it. Uh, but I mean, there's certain things like when we can talk about the ancient, ancient astronaut stuff. I, I personally don't believe aliens built uh, anything on this planet as far as megalithic structures. And we've talked about this before when you've been on. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you could say something might be dangling the carrot you know, for us or bringing us along or influencing us via altered states of consciousness and um, playing off of our consciousness. Uh, is that what you, is that where you stand now currently? Is that what you still believe that there's some sort of interaction there, but it's not, there's not actual physical beings coming here, landing here and building things? Well, I don't believe they built much, uh, if anything. I do believe that there were extraterrestrials or extraterrestrial probes that have been to earth. And the reason I say that is I've got to go to the greatest skeptic of all time, the skeptic that all the current skeptics believe was the greatest of all time. And that was Carl Sagan back in 1963 in a journal article that Sagan wrote, it was published in the journal space and science. Sagan calculated the odds of other civilizations visiting earth in ancient times and he said in that article it is an absolute certainty that they were here and he also gave the statistic that they had probably visited more than 10,000 times now that sounds like a lot but it's 10,000 times over roughly 2 million years so if you divide 2 million years by 10,000 you're not having a visit a year. You're not having a visit every 10 years. Uh, it's kind of infrequent. And what he said is about 2 million years ago, when the first, uh, when our first ancestors came along and evolved, he said they probably started coming a little kind of infrequently, 
to see how we were evolving. But after the end of the last ice age, he said their visits probably increased substantially. Now, he's not saying that they were sitting in flying saucers and flying here and going back and forth and that the beings were here and looking around and all that. Uh, but it, it, it's also possible that they had some kind of probes, remote probes. But the thing that, that he said, and this, keep this in mind, 1963, he said that ancient Sumerian texts and legends and like Baalbek and those things may well have been there because of extraterrestrial visits. And that is what we needed to look at. Again, that was Carl Sagan, 1963, uh, in, in, a, in a journal. So Sagan said it's an absolute certainty. There are several other astronomers that are real famous that said it's an absolute certainty. But Sagan didn't believe that modern UFOs, the things that people report as UFOs and the glowing lights that are seen all the time, uh, and even the modern abductions, the contactees and all that, he didn't believe that was extraterrestrial. And I don't either. So that's where I'm at. I don't believe that what people are seeing are thousands of UFOs around Earth, that there are 10 or 12 different types of them. Some of them look like insects. Some of them are gray. Some of them are Nordics, whatever. Uh, I don't believe any of that. Uh, so that's where I kind of stick with, with Carl Sagan in that. Of course, he didn't know what they were. He wrote uh, a book about uh, the goblin universe or the, the haunted demonic universe, whatever, that there's demons everywhere. And he didn't mean demons in the sense of uh, like angelic demons. Uh, he meant that it is haunting us, that whatever it is, is haunting us. Uh, and even uh, Jacques Vallée is kind of in that ballpark too. Maybe so more like the Greek daemon, like some sort of yeah. metaphysical entity that people interact with kind of a thing. Yeah, something that would be in the realm of paranormal. I hate the word supernatural, but it, supernatural simply means that we don't really understand what it is. It's beyond our understanding right now. Right. Um, on the UFO episode we did with you a while back, you thought that some of the UAP sightings could be holographic projection technology that we possibly have. Do you still believe this, or have you changed your mind? And also, we've asked some military people after that and they said that that would be against the law to use our own advanced technology on our own military so i didn't know if you had a uh it would be against the law to use our our advanced technology on our own military but they weren't using it on our own military uh there's nothing that happened to them they simply saw things in infrared uh and the radar the new radar systems they had uh i still believe that that was testing uh it's kind of complicated uh the navy and contractors for the Navy have the technology to produce um, laser-based. When people think of a laser, they think of a visible light that's different colors and all that, but they're not, they don't necessarily have to be visible. So yes, I believe that um, there's about a half a page in that new book that goes through the Navy's different, um, really, inventions. Uh, they invented a whole series of devices, one of which can beam a beam words into your head. You hear spoken words in your head. And right at the last time that I saw the technical specs on it, it worked at about a mile distance or a mile and a half. Uh, they can also form lights in front of people and in different places. And when I say lights, I'm talking about a glowing ball of light, uh, a plasma, plasmas. So, yes, I still believe that uh, it, it would be illegal for the Navy to do it on their own people, but it's not like they were attacking anything. Uh, the, none of the pilots got close so to the object. So you think maybe they were just like testing it or something, and then they just so happened to come across it kind of with like an accidental... And it's not. I don't know. think it's accidental at all. They were, if you actually know about what they were doing... Um, the Nimitz and so on. They were testing new radar systems. They were testing uh, various uh, new equipment. And uh, the pilots were also testing new equipment and new radars. Uh, and I believe that, yeah, there's somewhere in private contractors, uh, in uh, black military, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and they are simply seeing how pilots react 
to things that they can't see. Remember, they didn't visually see any of the objects, uh, but they could well, pick them up the, on radar. Well, some of the, like, Fravor, you know, and uh, I think Dietrich, the pilots from that Nemet sighting actually did see the object, the Tic Tac, go by their... Oh, yeah, okay. All so right. there are some of the incidences they did get eyes on it. So, I mean... I don't know how that hologram technology works, but uh, well, it's it's a it's a plasma. They're I wouldn't rule a, it out though that that would be yeah. maybe a portion, you know, because like how people say, ninety five percent of the sightings are things that can be explained away, anyways, right. or you know, whatever. So, um, well, the the Navy. One more thing about this: the Navy actually patented. I I, read, I first heard about this in Forbes because Forbes monitors patents. The Navy patented a technology to produce decoys in the air, flying decoys in the air. There's a patent. You can read it. Go online and uh, anybody go online, look up Navy patent decoys with lasers. Look it up. It's there. They produce decoys in the air that appear to be flying, that they can change the shape, the color. They change the frequency from visible light to ultraviolet or infrared, depending on what they want to do. And I believe, yes, they were testing it. I don't think the pilots knew about it. They simply wanted to know how they'd react. I don't think it was coming off the carrier, though. I don't do think, think anybody in the carrier knew it. Do you think that was based off of something that they've seen or something otherworldly at some point? Or do you think that that's just something? Or do you think they're trying to recreate that effect? Into, um, do you know what I'm that, saying? Like, do you... uh, Okay, we locked up for a second. That is very interesting. One of the stories that is in the the book is about a series of UFO sightings and a physicist study of them. He was the the guy's name was Harley Rutledge. He was the chairperson of the Department of Physics for Southeastern State, Missouri, in uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Uh, he did field studies with a couple hundred people. And one of the things that he reported and actually saw pretty interesting, it was, he called it a bullet shape. It was the exact dimensions he said was 210 feet long. And it went over his house and over the Mississippi River. Uh, and a bullet shape to me, he didn't talk about the rear end of it, you know, but it's kind of like a Tic Tac. Right. I had since talked to two people uh, in New Madrid, Missouri, who also saw the same thing. Uh, one of those was a uh, bank president. The other one was a assistant principal in a school. Uh, and they didn't want to talk about it. They had been at a party like at midnight one night and decided we're not going to talk about this. But of course, back then, and this was in like 1973, there were so many UFO reports in the state of Missouri that it just it became overwhelming. Uh, and even even the National Guard and the Air Force tried to look into it to see what they were. So maybe the tic tac shape, um, you know, in the old UFO reports, a lot of them are about cigar shaped objects. So right. maybe they were trying to do that. And I wouldn't, I really wouldn't discount anything. But I don't think those are alien. Absolutely, they're not alien. I think some of the stuff, some of the Navy stuff some of the pilot stuff around airports and maybe the one, I don't remember the name of it, where they're looking at something over the water. I think some of those are drones, but I'm not sure of that. It's just, that's a guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't accept it as extraterrestrial stuff. It's definitely interesting. That's for sure. Yeah. Worth studying. Well, I mean, if nothing else too, I mean, you have other people too, like Avi Loeb and the Galileo Project actually oh, yeah. using actual scientific observation to collect data and try and see what these things are. I mean, I, I've said it before too, even if it's some new physical phenomenon, that's super exciting too. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to be alien to get my attention. So, um, yeah, interesting. Uh, so let's move on here to some stuff in your, your part of the book. Um, in your part, you know, you talk about Young's take on the UFO phenomenon and how most people have misinterpreted um, or misrepresented his take on the subject as it relates to the mind and symbolism. Um, I guess my question would be if Young thought the phenomenon could materialize or be perceived in a material world, what does that mean in terms of the nature of reality? Is that like anything immaterial can materialize and vice versa? Or do you think more along the lines of like Plato's theory of forms where there's some other realm that we're almost like a replica of or something like that? 
That's interesting. I hadn't I hadn't thought of uh, Plato's realm in this, but yeah, I'd say it's between uh, Jung and Plato. It's kind of a combination of the two. Jung Jung talked about psychoid manifestations. Of course, his theory, Jung's theory, which he which he put out in 1961 in the United States, uh, in a book called Flying Saucers: A Modern Myth of Things Seen in the Sky. Uh, Jung thought that a couple things were happening. First of all, he said that what people are seeing is uh, an archetypal manifestation. And, and when it's archetypal, it means it's something symbolic. And when, when you have an object that you don't know what it is, you project a meaning onto that. So if you see some unknown, your own mind is projecting a meaning onto it. It is archetypal in that what most people were reporting back then were disc-shaped objects, which Jung said was a mandala. Uh, a mandala is a symbol of the whole. And back in 1984, I wrote a book called The Archetype Experience. And in it, uh, it was a follow-up to Jung's book. And in that, I basically said that what, what the mandala it consists of are all the splintered archetypes. The archetypes exist in opposites. We've already said one, angel, demon. Like you have a good angel and you have bad angels, which are demons. Uh, also, the wise man and the fool. Uh, Satan and Christ would be, would be one. But there are a, a number of these opposite archetypes. And Jung said that under some conditions, archetypes can manifest physically because they, they are psychoid factors. And the word psychoid means uh, energy that can bridge the gap between just being pure energy and becoming physical. And he said this occurs on what he called, he called it the, the electromagnetic psychic spectrum. And it's the same thing that John Keel in the 70s just simply said is the electromagnetic energy spectrum. Mm -hmm. So in the EM spectrum, you have right in the middle for about 5% of it, you have visible light. And then on one side, you have ultraviolet light, which we can't see. And on the other side, you have infrared. And these two extremes, it goes further and further till you get to extremely long waves, which actually the U.S. Navy uses for underwater or undersea communication. And then on the other end, you have extremely small, short, high intensity waves, which are like gamma rays. So what Jung and uh, John Keel were saying was under some conditions, energy is able to change its frequency from the ultraviolet end or the infrared end into the visible energy spectrum. And it's all about vibration. And then it becomes visible. And because it's energy, it can manifest some physicality the way plasmas do. So let's get into a plasma just to explain it. A plasma is pure energy when it starts, but then it heats up all the atoms. It becomes highly charged ball of gas with spinning electrons, and it starts pulling in matter in space, which is what outer space is filled with plasma. In space, there's cosmic dust. Here on Earth, there's also dust. There's all kinds of stuff always floating around. And what plasma does is it attracts this dust. There's a report that the, the British government put out called Project Condine, C-O-N-D-I-G-N. Uh, it came out and I believe it was released publicly in 2006. And in it, it said that exotic plasmas or dusty plasmas were the source of most UFO reports. Mm. So that's Jung and uh, John Keel both had the same basic idea, but of course they were talking about it in very different ways. But then I'm not just saying these were, were just plasmas as people think of them. Back when people discovered plasmas and started talking about it, and I'll, I'll say it, plasma is the fourth state of matter. Oh, you have solids. We got, we got Maurice joining in here. Hold All right. Come on. on in, Maurice. All right. Let's get this this uh, jolly, oh, jolly Maurice in here. <laughs> Make sure your USB is connected, Maurice. I'm all set up, my friend. All right. 
Sorry. Good so evening. Not, so we were talking about mm-hmm. that the spectrum with Keel and the yeah. Plasma. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, hi, I didn't Maurice. mean to cut you. I, <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> this guy just killed the entire conversation. No, um, no, no. I'm no, joking. No. I'm joking. No. Okay. So dusty plasmas. What what Project Condine said is a dusty plasma. It starts rotating because it it it's, it has a north pole and a south pole, and it's electromagnetic. And as it spins, it starts to flat. It starts to flatten out. And as it flattens out, it can shoot out. They they have actually produced some of these, and they shoot out different lights. I'm interested in some that probably look like they have portholes on them. I mean, that's a stretch. But this this gets really weird when you get into it. So let's talk a little more about plasmas. Okay, so four states of matter, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And it has its own branch of physics, basically, too. Like people that study plasma physics don't really study the other stuff. that They're just focused on that. So in 2007, six physicists published an article in the peer-reviewed Journal of New Physics. And in that article... They had been producing plasmas in the laboratory. And what they said is that plasmas, if they're sustained, if they have enough energy to sustain them, have all the characteristics of living beings. So let me explain what that means, of life. And they said that given the right circumstance, now remember, these are six mainstream physicists. They say under the right circumstance, they might become sentient, that is, have thoughts, intelligence, and be able to communicate. Mm. Now, that's astonishing. Now, how they they said that they have evolutionary properties and appear to be alive. So what does that mean? What they did is they observed in the center of the plasmas, they observed literally a double helix forming in it, just like human DNA, a double helix. And they observed connections in the double helix. And then they observed the double helix splitting like DNA does. It produces RNA, and RNA makes protein. And that's how cell replication occurs. And they observed the plasmas splitting into additional plasmas. It had evolutionary properties in that what they observed and what they wrote in the article is that the plasmas that had a weak internal structure, that their double helix was weak, and was not fully formed. They tended to die or disappear and not replicate. The ones with the really strong double helix in them replicated easily. And what they said is that they believed given enough time, they might well have intelligence. So even physics says this. So here's here's where I am at with this. I think the earth generates a lot of natural energy, and I think people have been interacting with that natural energy for a long, long time, which means ever since the first ancestors of of Homo sapiens sapiens, us, since our first ancestors, they have been interacting with this energy. Over time, they learned how to interact with it, and they they built sacred sites that would allow them to interact with it. They found the use of certain drugs allowed them to interact with it. Uh, They found that rocks, crystals, water, and so on could be formed in certain patterns such as earthworks and mounds and interact with it. Sometimes this form would come on its own and interact with them. Uh, when When it comes to you, it can't be trusted. This is Native American. We're getting into the Native American part now. When you interact with these forms, you really can't trust them at first because they're tricksters. And when I say they're tricksters, I'm coming strictly from the Native American perspective on it. And actually, I first learned about tricksters from Carl Jung. Carl Jung talked about him in his book on flying saucers. Uh, And think about it. How many contactee stories have you heard from the 50s and 60s where a saucer landed in front of somebody, some being walks out and says, I'm from Jupiter or I'm from Mars or I'm from Venus or I live on the moon. We know that that's probably not true. Right. Uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure nobody's living on Saturn, at least people that <laughs> look like us. I don't think there's any Nordics living there. You know, there's mm-hmm. Nordic beings and there's all these others, but these beings can't be trusted. Uh, so 
what, what Jung said and what Native Americans say is you got to get by that trickster part to get to the truth of it. And so the book has got a lot of examples of some people that are fooled by it. Some of the early events, uh, Manuel Swedenborg is a good one to talk about there. And some of the ones that apparently got beyond the trickster a bit, but still were tricked now and then. That's that's Edgar Cayce, uh, also Joan of Arc. There are several other things. Uh, uh, you had the you had the audio version. I don't know if you saw the pictures of Zaytun, Egypt, uh, but I consider the Zaytun apparitions apparitions of the late '60s and '70s to be some of the most incredible things that ever happened. Uh, absolute proof that this reality, whatever it is, the Native Americans called it spiritual. I think it exists, but I think that the force behind it is plasma based. Mm. And I think that's what Project Condine found. And I believe that's what the U.S. Navy has found also. So also the trickster thing. I mean, that's we, we hit a lot on that on the show in the past, especially even with psychedelics. So psychedelics and UFOs are pretty much when you're talking about like altered states of consciousness. That's usually where the trickster comes in. And um, even look at some of the gods you mentioned Egypt. I mean, Thoth was known as kind of a trickster god, um, uh, you know. Who, I mean, you can go throughout history. There's tricksters throughout history and uh, that archetype. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a, it's an interesting thing. And I'm going to ask you some questions about that here in a little bit. But I want to ask you one more question about Young before we move on. Uh, based on Young's research, you know, the since UFOs represent symbols of some sort of unknown phenomenon to the individual mind, do you think like the mass sightings imply a collective unconscious or do we all perceive that same phenomena simul similarly since we all have the same evolutionary senses? Well, I think if you're seeing a light in the sky and it's in the distance, I think we'd all perceive it similarly. We would project different meanings onto it. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody might immediately say, and I've seen people do this, say, oh, that's a UFO. Uh, and it, it, it technically it is. It's an unidentified flying object. But to me, it's probably a plane. Uh, and it's because I'm, I'm actually pretty skeptical about things and people know that, although I get into some really weird ideas in this. <laughs> and, um, so basically everybody hates me. Uh, the ET people, I believe in ET. Well, we love you, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I've already said, I do believe in the extraterrestrial hypothesis. I will not at all say that, uh, I'm, I'm certain that ETs have been here. Uh, but I believe that mostly what is being interacted with in the whole UFO phenomenon and the legitimate part of it is a type of Earth-based energy which has some sort of intelligence and it conforms its shape and its appearance and its behavior to the expectations, the unconscious expectations of whoever's perceiving it and I believe it also conforms to the cultural expectations of who's ever perceiving it. So kind of and like a valet, is, passport to Magonia kind exactly. of. Exactly. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that's an interesting uh, hypothesis. And then, I mean, based on what we've studied and researched and people we've talked to, I wouldn't rule that out of the question. There's something going on. Uh, like I said, I think something that happens in altered states, whether it's meditation, deep prayer, near-death experiences, psychedelic experiences, all these different altered states maybe allow you to get out of your built-in pareidolia of, of your uh, mind, your your day-to-day -day consciousness, and allows you to maybe experience some of the stuff that you're talking about. And that's why people that have these experiences talk about these things, and there is some crossover there. So. Well, that, you guys are into that. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about like DMT or um, Delta 8, Delta 10, uh, the THC. So I, I visualize this in a weird way. Okay, so when you're on the under the influence of those substances, I think initially what occurs is it's kind of like it, whatever your filtering system is, the filtering system uh, that keeps the unconscious below the surface. The filtering system basically doesn't work. And I believe you have all these ideas and thoughts, everything in your unconscious kind of jiggles out. And when it comes out, it starts making connections. 
And depending on, and those connections can be pretty weird. They can be, they can tie really strange things together. But at some point in this process, you start interacting with something. So the question is, the thing that you're interacting with, is it part of your own unconscious or have you opened up something and you're starting to perceive something that's actually there, but because our brain is filtering it out and not allowing us to contact it, are we then in contact with it? That is kind of a a big question in this. And I know that the shaman, ancient shaman, Native Americans, uh, Native American rituals with the mound builders, which is one of my, you know, that's one of my big things. Uh, they used these hallucinogenic substances to interact with these beings. Uh, but they also said that under the right circumstances, these things would materialize in the physical form. And there's, there's mm. just too many accounts of that. The uh, Cheyenne Massam ceremony is one. Uh, and that's described in the book pretty fully. Uh, and they said that, that doing this under the right circumstances brings out the Mayan, which are the earth spirits. Uh, it's the same thing as the Muslim jinn, maybe the fairies of uh, British lore. Um, and, and actually, every, that's every, what Young said, though, too, right? That's what I mentioned before. Yeah. Young, Young mentions that these things can materialize. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's super interesting in that regard to think of, you know, what is the nature of reality then if things can materialize and immaterialize as quickly. You know, I, I just... Um, it's something that like you say it, it sounds kind of crazy, but then when you look at everything we just talked about, these altered states of consciousness and these ceremonies and these experiences, it's what is going on then. So either um, we really don't understand the mind at all and we're all hallucinating <laughs> all the time, which yeah. some scientists would agree with that, like Anil Seth yeah. and some of these other people. Uh, but based on my own experiences, and I think you could speak to this as well, uh, there's too many weird things that have happened, synchronicities that have happened. I mean, I believe there is more going on. I don't know what that is yet, but that's why we're here talking about this right now. So, I have said in that book, and it's a quote from prior books about synchronicity. Synchronicity, well, let's de- define it for some people. It means a meaningful coincidence. Uh, it's like you're thinking of someone and then the phone rings and it's that person. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That that would be a, a really simple case of synchronicity. Jung actually uh, parted with Carl with uh, Sigmund Freud because of synchronicity, and it right. was an event. Yeah, really interesting event. But Jung wrote about it, um, and in his in in the example he used, he was talking with a patient, and they were talking about the patient's dream, and in the dream, the the patient saw a scarab beetle, uh, a dung beetle, basically. And while they were talking about it, Jung heard this tapping at the window, tap, tap, tap. Uh, And he ignored it at first, but it got really persistent. He got up, opened the window, and something flew through and he caught it. And it was a beetle. And it was, it's a meaningful coincidence in time and space. Very, Mm -hmm. very meaningful to him. So that is synchronicity. But what I believe and what I've said is that synchronicity is actually an awareness of the connection of all things. Most of us don't have that awareness. In fact, it would be very disturbing if we did. Uh, it's kind of like if you if you could see the entire electromagnetic energy spectrum, you wouldn't see anything. All you'd have is just waves and motion everywhere. That's why our eyes, our rods and cones are tuned just to the visible light portion of it. Otherwise, we couldn't navigate in the physical world. Uh, but synchronicity synchronicity is again the awareness of the connection of all things which is a very big native american statement all things are connected and i say th- i see it as there's a web everywhere an interconnected web and i'm not talking about the internet actually i wrote about that before the internet existed uh, and call it the people of the web uh, and yeah, then of course book, everybody knows yeah, and everybody think, oh, internet. No, I'm. Well, I wasn't we have Indra's about web too, which is kind of a similar concept. Yeah, plug it, baby, plug yeah. it. <laughs> which will be oh, in the App Store soon. <laughs> All right. Um, no, but so yeah, it, I, I do want to yeah, read that book. Still, I've, I've not gotten people of the web, but I know what it's about. I want to check that out. If if you if you think of it that way, if you if you actually take a spider's web, 
And again, the spider's a trickster. Spider's a Native American trickster, but it also is a bringer of knowledge. It's both good and bad. It can be either one. And the spider weaves this web. Now, if you if you go to any part of a spider's web and you vibrate it, the entire web vibrates. And I think that's how quantum mechanics work. Uh, I, Andrew has talks a lot about that at the end of the book. Uh, he talks about non-causality and all that. Uh, but I believe everything is connected and that under certain circumstances, you become aware of those connections when astonishing coincidences happen. But again, if we if we were aware of that all the time, it would be a mess. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be aware of all the connections, everything cause and effect everywhere. So, right. all right. I mean, no, that no, kind of supports that my sense. theory. Like, uh, they call me Mr. Vibrations, but I, <laughs> I very much subscribe to the, the fact where you, when your vibration is ra raised and, uh, you're in this higher state that you, you will notice more coincidences and interesting and in, interestingly enough, that's actually why we started the podcast for people that don't know that Michael had a synchronicity that spawned this entire podcast. So that's pretty cool. Wow. Did that involve both of you? No, uh, no. no. I mean, him. I mean, Maurice has always been a part. We've always talked about this weird stuff even before gotcha. that and stuff. So we've, and we're cousins, so we've always had that weird connection. We're almost like brothers in that sense. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, so uh, but the, the I got to check that, that con what you're talking about, the divergence of Jung from uh, Freud uh, on synchronicities. I got to look into that more. I know that they diverge too. Young wanted to get away from all the sexual archetype stuff. He didn't, you know, wasn't really in favor of any of that stuff. So I know he diverged on that path as well. But yeah, I got to check that out for sure. And it, it uh, was psychic stuff too. Young was into psychic stuff. Young right. actually did a dissertation on a trance channeler, which is weird because he's an MD, but he decided to do a dissertation. Right. Um, so we talked a little bit about the plasma stuff. Have you discovered anything new on, you know, based on your research with the plasma or is this all just the culmination of your, your work and research over the span of you writing these books? Uh, I can't say I have anything beyond the, uh, what's in that book. Uh, I did. I just mean like new in the sense that like when you wrote the book, there was something that came to you like an epiphany or something that came oh. while writing the book. No, I, I, no, I can't say that that, that that's occurred. No, I'm actually pretty systematic when I write okay. uh, and yeah, very, very systematic, but I accumulate a lot of information, do a great deal of research. The, the, the epiphany that I had on plasmas and so on and, and the military research. And when I say military, I don't mean that there's a U.S. Army base that's doing this or the Office hmm. of Naval Research is doing it. What I mean is, is private contractors are doing it. And my epiphany came in the 90s when I went into the government documents, the government repository library for the first time uh, at what was then Memphis State University and started finding all these really obscure, non-circulated government journals on all sorts of military things. And in those, they refer to studies that have never seen the light of day because they're not published. They are, they're all grant funded. Uh, also at the same time, I was corresponding a little with Michael Persinger at Laurentian university in Canada, who was doing research in plasmas. Uh, he was be, he was giving people UFO experiences in a copper shielded room at Laurentian university by just having them sit there in this room in a nice comfortable reclining chair and close their eyes and they were having ufo experiences in there because he was beaming in um electromagnetic uh, balls of electromagnetic energy people saw ufos it was called that when he did it with a helmet it was called the god helmet for a while and laurentian university was actually picketed by uh, some fundamentalist christian groups there but a number of people used it some claimed to uh, meet angels, uh, long involved story, but that's how I really got into this was with the research with Michael Persinger. Hmm. Interesting. I know, uh, is it Dr. Anthony Parrott who Dr. Robert Schock references a lot in his work with the petroglyphs and how his plasma research from Los Alamos showed 
similar figures to the figures you see in the petroglyphs and the animal shaped headed gods of the, you know, ancient world and things like that. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but that's kind of interesting. It might, might tie into all that. Does that relate to shock's idea of the uh, younger Dryas being caused by? Yeah. Well, he, he, that's what he uses. He references Parat to show that, but Parat's research on its own is pretty interesting. If you look at that, then you look at the figures in the petroglyphs. So um, whether they happened 10,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago, I think it's still pretty interesting. So, yeah, interesting. I actually, in 1994, in a book, uh, Grand Illusions actually talked about the solar, solar plasma theory too, that it, it could have caused some real problems here. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's, but some, I mean, there's a lot of vitrification weirdness to at yeah. certain sites too. Um, there's a part of your book, uh, Origins of the Gods, where you discuss one of your Native American friends that came to stay with you and your wife. Uh, he came with you to your office one day and sat in this chair that had electromagnetic, electromagnetic fields uh, attached to it, or some. I don't know. Maybe you can explain it. But he had a yeah. trickster experience, and he saw a bunch of little blue beans. Um, since that experience, did anybody that sat in that chair have a similar experience? Was there any crossover? Uh, I used it a number of times. Uh, several other people, including, well, l- let me set it up. Okay. I, okay. I, was doing, I was doing a small private practice at the time, uh, and this was in the uh, 80s. Uh, 80, I think we got the device in 87 in this little private practice, very part-time. But I was in practice with a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And so I went in on a Sunday. This guy's name was Lou White Eagle. He was a Cheyenne um, shaman. He was the arrow priest of the Cheyenne. Uh, He came to Memphis uh, because uh, archaeologists from Memphis State were then about to conduct a dig into a mound in downtown Memphis, supposedly the mound uh, where Hernando de Soto first saw the Mississippi River in 1541 or 42, whatever it was, I think 42. Uh, so anyway, he came here, and long long story there, but we, my wife and I invited Lou White Eagle, his wife, and three kids to come stay with us during this, uh, the protest event. He stayed 30 days. He left the day that the Memphis City Council passed a resolution that there'd be no digs in that mound site. So uh, I had that private practice on a Sunday I asked Lou if he wanted to go along to the office with me and test out this device we had. So we went out and I had to go do some insurance. The device is called a Gram Potentializer, spelled like Graham Cracker, but Gram Potentializer. It's actually like a, it's almost like a uh, massage table. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a couch or a bed. You recline on it. It does two things. It creates an electromagnetic bubble around the person and that bubble uh, is tuned to the Schumann residence. Then that's the Earth's primary ambient frequency that it vibrates. Uh, so the Schumann residence, and it also it goes around, up and down, very gently every seven seconds. So it's tuned to the Earth's um, to waves, ocean waves, the average cycle of an ocean wave. So you lay on it one end or the other, depending on whether you want the North Pole at your head or the North Pole at your feet. Uh, He laid on it. I went to another room to fill out some insurance forms. About 10 minutes later, Lou walked into the room and was just visibly shaken. Now, this is a big guy. This Lou was about 6'2", probably weighed 230 or so, and he came in. And I looked at him and he was visibly shaken. And the words that he said were little blue people. And I went, what? And he said, little blue people, little blue people are in the room. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, I laid down and I saw these little blue people. They were looking in the window. Now, I saw there were three windows in this room to the outside. And what he said is, what he explained is he, when he laid down, he closed his eyes and for some reason, he opened his eyes and he saw these little blue people looking through the windows. And then he said he became paralyzed and he watched them literally mold or come right through the windows and the walls. And he said they came through all the walls and they surrounded him. 
and they started poking on his body. And he said that just scared him so much. And obviously it broke the spell of paralysis. And he got up and walked out of that room, went down the hall to the room I was in and then told me the story. Of course, I walked to the room. Uh, he didn't turn the device off. So it was still doing its gradual seven second rotation. And it makes some noise as it does that. Uh, and I didn't see anything. He didn't really want to talk about it. He didn't ask to get back on the device. Uh, he didn't want to. And later, because uh, he was there for several weeks after this, he started talking about it. And he said it's a trickster, that these were the little people, but these were this was the trickster part of the little people. And of course, the little people is a lot of Native American lore. So what I experienced on the device was literally flying into space. Just, I, I laid there, I never expected it, and just felt myself zoom out into space through the solar system, saw lots of stars and lots of planets. And I re the thing I remember most wasn't going out, but it was at the end of the experience, just suddenly just bam, coming right mm -hmm. back into the body. That's what I recall. The psychologist and psychiatrist used it quite a bit also. The, uh, the male psychiatrist, good friend of mine, he was my major professor in for my, well, yeah, for my master's degree in psychopharmacology. Uh, he had some similar experiences to me and then some he wouldn't talk about. I don't know what the psychiatrist experienced with it. Uh, there was some controversy about it. We got rid of it because there was some belief that uh, that device may actually cause cancer uh, mm -hmm. and they recalibrated or something. I don't know the whole story of that, but they they did they didn't use that anymore, but they were actually into getting a lot of things. In fact, uh, in the in um, a new issue, a reissue of Grand Illusions, I tell a story about how I got into all this, that it was because of that psychologist and psychiatrist. Uh, when I was 23 years old and an undergraduate student at Memphis State. Actually, uh, I started with them when I was 19, but when I was 23, we really got into this. We went to seances. We tried pyramid power. We built pyramids in our laboratories. Uh, this was We were doing real psychopharmacology research. In fact, our, our first publications were in the uh, Society for Neuroscience publications on morphine addiction and the drug scotophobin. Uh, so you can look that up. Scotophobin is kind of cool, but that's another story. Uh, but that we went to all that stuff. We tried pyramid power. We hooked plants up to a physiograph machine, uh, an eight channel physiograph to see if plants could feel, if plants could tell who was in the room. Uh, we did experiments where somebody would pull a leaf off and uh, it was all done anonymously, and then we'd see if the plant could tell when the person who pulled the leaf off was in the room. Uh, we we wanted to see if uh, if you put dull razors in a pyramid, uh, or if you put food in a pyramid, what would happen to it? So the idea was, or what we were told, is that razors would resharpen in a pyramid, and uh, food would never get bad. Uh, plants and seeds would grow better. We didn't find any of that. We did find that plants could, in fact, identify the individual who tore a leaf off. And that, that really surprised us all. Yeah. Oh. No, that, that's, that sounds kind of interesting and probably fun uh, experiments back in the day. Um, well, that makes me nervous with all the growing I've done. Are these plants going to come back at, after me? Because I've been well, ripping gonna, off leaves left and right. I was, I was going to ask you, have you seen that recent article about <laughs> mushrooms or fungi actually communicating? Um, there's like 50 noises or something that they can make that they communicate with each other. It said it was similar to human communication. I have seen some research and some uh, very brief articles about that. I've also seen research that they believe now plants, in fact, most plants do, in fact, communicate. Trees do. Um, uh, I'm not surprised a bit. The Native Americans said that for all time, yeah. uh, for thousands and thousands of years. And their idea is that everything is made, we're all made from the same thing. It is a type of primordial spiritual energy. It's all connected and that it all is alive. Mm. 
Um, and you mentioned these little blue people. Now, that's interesting from an altered states um, aspect, you know, uh, these people poking and prodding. There's a lot of people that do DMT um, uh, or have near-death experiences. I know specifically DMT where Pachimama or the the mother, you know, or mother earth mm-hmm. goddess is blue and usually comes to people as an apparition. Um, you also have uh, people that do DMT and other psychedelics that feel like they're being operated on or people, entities are doing things to them. Uh, do you think that that could be connected to that kind of a thing? And if you think yeah. uh, those are some sort of archetype of the experience, what do you think is actually happening there? Like, why are, what are they doing? Is that something that happens normally, or is that just in that experience? Or uh, Lou said these things were real; they were physically real, and he literally said they and showed me. I remember him doing this. They poked on me like this. They were poking me all mm-hmm. over, and he said it was real. Now I have no reason to that to disbelieve that he's now deceased uh lou was uh, he was a very important fellow in indigenous societies and uh i don't think he lied i think he was telling me exactly what he believed i have never had that experience um i have a suspicion why but Mm -hmm. i've never had that experience as to what's going on uh based on this theory uh that that i have and that andrew actually goes a little further with with quantum mechanics and so on uh yeah they're they're temporarily physically real in the book i call them time beings spelled t-i-i-m-e and time beings are transient intrusions of intelligent manifesting energy Hmm. they're transient because they're temporal they never last you know, a saucer doesn't land and then they go, so the, the person that sees it goes, oh, hey, wait a minute, let me call all my buddies out. And then everybody comes over you know, and bangs on the side. It's transient. It's always temporary. It's temporal. It doesn't last long. Right. It's an intrude. These things are intrusions. They pop into our reality. They just manifest in our reality. They're intelligent because they interact with us. Hmm. They have some sort of intelligence and they have a purpose I think they're like messengers with the idea that angels in the biblical sense are always messengers. There's different kinds of messages that they may give, but they are also manifesting energy. I believe the energy is electromagnetic. Uh, I believe that it is eminent, that it's, it, the energy is pulled from the earth or perhaps the atmosphere, probably plasma, doesn't have to be, but again, I see them as time beings. Andrew calls them N beings, little N, uh, in the scientific sense of N meaning number, that it could be any number. And I believe they can manifest anywhere. There are certain places where they manifest more than other places. There are certain mental conditions we can have for them to manifest. But so the question that you've asked is, if we had a camera in that room where Lou was, what would we see? That's kind of uh, a question that you were asking, right? right? What would we see if we were watching it? And the answer is, I think we might have seen something odd. I think I, I think he saw these blue beings. What we might see are lights, manifesting lights that almost look like orbs, but they're not orbs. I think we'd see some visible light forms because i think that is where these manifest from and that's Mm. how we perceive them interesting yeah i just thought that was interesting we're talking about electromagnetic spectrums and earth energy and he's talking about blue beans and again those have been associated with you know south american indigenous tribes and ayahuasca ceremonies and all that kind of stuff so um let's move on here a little bit i I did want to ask you though with the trickster stuff so i mean usually i ask this to our psychedelic guests and our altered states guests but do you think that the trickster archetype do you think that's something that's grained within us or do you think there is like do you think it's part of our mind that's manifesting itself or do you think that it is an external actual presence and i can i can guess what your answer might be but i just would like to ask that question. well it's actually both uh, okay. We trick ourselves. We trick ourselves all the time. That's where Jung, Jung. What Jung said is that all the archetypal forms are already within us. The symbols are in us already. 
the symbols are already in it. So we're all capable of doing really stupid stuff. I mean, right. we, and we hope we sometimes hope that what we do is going to work, uh, but we're capable of doing some really stupid things. So from the psychological perspective, the trickster is usually uh, in invoked to for us to explain away the stupidity that we have. But on another sense, the trickster is very real. Uh, yes, it manifests in a very real form, too. Mm. Uh, and Jung believed that also, that the trickster really is a real thing. Uh, so what we have here is an interaction. Again, all things are connected. We're all made out of the same stuff, and we're all part of the same stuff. And we're all in that same web. So I have a trickster built in me and I've tricked myself many times. You know, often we come to certain conclusions and we make assumptions and we're totally wrong. Uh, and we feel like fools after it. And that's like we, we've been tricked by our own trickster. Uh, but there is a trickster out there too uh, that will manifest under certain conditions. Just like I believe that there are entities that are these time beings that were angels that appeared in ancient times in a different form because that's the cultural expectation that those people had yeah, looks like i'm weirding out maurice over there no, he, no he's, he looks he's like he, no he's i like, love this oh, stuff man yeah. i mean i remember last time you were talking we kind of got into the plasma stuff and then when i joined the conversation today you guys were sounds like you've been doing a lot of research on that and uh have kept came to some some conclusions uh, of your own so i'm just glad that i got to, to jump on this and listen to your your wisdom i really I, I love you as a guest so i'm glad you came back well thank you i just think that plasma is the energy that they use to manifest yeah uh, i don't i don't think it's just a ball of a ball of charged gas i think there's something else going I on i think it's these... one of the, the least known aspects of physics as i mentioned before too yeah. um yeah, so yeah yeah for sure it's gonna be uh interesting to see what comes of that for sure um so do you think that, uh, do you think some of these physical mechanism explanations for these uh, phenomenological experiences rule out uh, the metaphysical implications? Or do you think that they are just the things that we can quantify or know based on our evolutionary senses? So I know that you obviously, we just talked about what you think, but do you think that the ones that are explained away via the physical mechanisms uh, are just that, or do you think that that still could be a connection to something? Meaning that, like somebody that has sleep paralysis, they encounter entities. Are those still possibly external entities, or are those internal entities? Same thing with somebody that smokes DMT. Are they experiencing internal entities or external entities? Like, what do you think is happening there? I I think that it sort of depends, but I think both are very possible. Uh, I'm sure. Well, uh, very possible. Both actually happen uh, as to any specific case. Uh, I, I, I couldn't say. It depends. Uh, but I think that uh, our mental state, well, we have an electromagnetic field around us. When you go into different mental states or when you use uh, a hallucinogenic drug or any other drug, you're actually changing your electromagnetic frequency. No matter what you do, when you eat, you're changing your electromagnetic frequency a little bit. Yeah. So I believe our mental state interacts with whatever's there and depending upon what the purpose of like one of these time forces might be or Andrews end beings, yes, they can physically manifest also. Uh, I believe something is physically manifesting, but not in all cases. That's the rub. And here, here's a really important thing. And it's a quote that's in the book. And it is this, that the, the hallucinations that come from, uh, mental illness look a lot like what people sometimes report as paranormal experiences. And the paranormal experiences can look a lot like mental illness to some people. And that is why skeptics will say it's all explainable. And there's a there's three or four pages in there about how skeptics explain everything. Uh, everything they explained it all, and and when they're left with no solution, uh, they say that it's mental illness that the person was somehow hallucinating or has some kind of uh, mental illness. But because the two look alike, a genuine mystical experience can look like mental illness, and mental illness can look like a genuine mystical experience. You have to partial that out and figure out which it is. 
I think some people have had genuine mystical experiences with real entities. On the other hand, some people have had mental illness that produces experiences that look a lot like a mystical experience. And it's really hard to tell the two apart sometimes. Well, I want to ask you this because, again, we this is something we know a lot about. Um, and we had Dr. Andrew Gallimore on before who is a neuro uh, uh, or a yeah, as a neurocomputational biologist or something yeah. along yeah. those lines. Anyways, he's you know studies DMT in the brain and everything. Uh, he wrote the book Alien Information Theory. But we were talking, and it seems like the hallucinations that come from um, uh, uh, tropanes is a lot different than an experience coming from tryptamines. Meaning that the tropanes experience your henbanes, your uh, a poor oh. feet or your, all, all those, yeah. uh, uh, scalp, lamine, all that stuff. Yep. Those are all actual hallucinations, meaning you're seeing stuff that isn't there is where a tryptamine experiments yeah. experience. You're seeing like, let's say it's psilocybin. You're seeing flowing patterns of things that are already there. You're not seeing things that aren't there. Um, mm -hmm. so is that kind of like what we're talking about right here where maybe there is a slight difference and that maybe you're mentioning, people seen entities that have other issues going on mentally, that that could be the hallucination aspect of it. And this other real experience thing could be more of like what the tryptamine experience is like, where you're actually having just an exaggeration version, an exaggerated version of some sort of altered state experience, but it's still real in the sense that um, reality is still coming through. You're not really out of your mind. Whew, boy, that is a deep question. Uh, <laughs> at, well, deep thinker, it, folks. As you as you were as you were speaking there, I was remembering uh, experiences from the 70s, uh, psilocybin, LSD. And what I'll say is this. I believe that some of this, of course, we know that there's crossover and sensory function and all that. A lot of the uh, neurochemistry and uh, neuroscience has been worked out on on exactly how they work. But I think some of what's going on with it is that the um, the eyes are tuned to pick up certain frequencies in the EM spectrum. And like I said, if we if we could see the whole EM spectrum, you wouldn't see anything. You just see flowing energy all over the place. You wouldn't be able to see anything. Uh, so I think that there's probably some changes that occur in the rods and cones and the frequency of what they're picking up, as well as changes in the frequency being picked up tac tactile wise feeling and also hearing all of our senses, the frequencies probably change and we are seeing things we don't normally see. We're seeing movements that uh, in the EM spectrum are actually there. So we may be seeing some of that. So uh, henbane and that, uh, let me say, if, if anybody's out there, don't use henbane. Don't do yeah, yeah. Well, none yeah. of the, none of the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, the tropanes are pleasant. Let's just right. say that. That's like the no. worst psychedelics. And you see a lot of, now they're finding all these vats in ancient Greece and ancient Rome where they're finding a lot of these tropanes and, um, uh, you know, like belladonna and all these different oh, yeah. uh, compounds. Um, a Datura is probably one of the main ones. And actually they've found uh, the pinwheel cave with the Datura and the little quids. I think we talked about that maybe last time you were on yeah. uh, in, in uh, California. But um, yeah, Datura is one of them. So you do have, and Datura is kind of found everywhere. But again, the tropane experience is not a pleasant experience as to what you see going on with the psychedelic therapy stuff and the, the tryptamine aspect of it. And I, even the MDMA stuff. So, um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's one of those ones where, um, uh, it's like, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, but again, I would make the comparison based on what you were saying to the difference in those compounds and the one that you're seeing something that's not there versus, you know, something that's ac uh, accenting something that you're already seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, basically. So, well, I think it's more than accenting on a day-to-day basis. Well, I yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously, we're yeah. We're seeing things we don't normally see that yeah, are actually there. For sure. That's what I'm saying. It's expanding. Yeah. Well, if you look at your mind as it's like a receiver, again, we could take it's stripping some of that pareidolia away, some of that built-in pattern recognition, and you're starting to see things that aren't, mm -hmm. um, you know, accessible at all times. So as where the psychedelic experience is, there's a lot more going on. I think that it can be taken to another level with, like, let's say a tropane, where you are having true 
hallucinations, no pun intended to the whole yeah. Terrence McKenna book. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, so, uh, but yeah, I was just curious what you thought on that. But I want to move on to this because I got a couple more questions here before we um, start to wrap it up. But um, so explain the two souls and death journey. So I, what I took from it is you have a soul, which is physical, um, uh, or, or life soul and it's based in matter. And then you have a free soul or a spiritual soul. That's purely metaphysical. Is this, did they? Yeah, did that's they, sort of it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a native American belief. It's also the belief of, uh, the ancient Egyptians. Uh, I got into it from the ancient Egyptians when Graham Hancock wrote his, uh, uh, which one is it? The, not the not the most recent one, but uh, the one right before it. I can't remember the title of it now. Uh, he got into that and actually said, yeah, the Native American mound builders idea here is the exact same thing as the Egyptian con and a couple other things. Oh, but anyway, the, the Graham Hancock book, his most recent one. Not the Well, the most recent one is, a, I um, think, another novel, but it's right yeah. before it. Uh, anyway. Uh, so the, there's two souls, but you, you have to start from their belief that everything is made out of spirit. Everything is alive. Everything is spiritual in nature. So dirt, earth is the most primordial spirit. Rock is condensed spirit. Crystal is, crystals are purified, condensed spiritual energy. Water is flowing spiritual energy. On Fire is the release of spiritual energy. So what they believed is this. They knew that we were physical uh, that we were made out of matter, that the matter came out of the mother. The mother was made, you know, was made of uh, the the food that she ate and so on. So they saw a life soul, that the physical body is itself alive. The matter is all alive because it's all primordial spirit. The life soul animates the body. So you need a body for this other soul that you call the metaphysical soul to come into and inhabit. So the other soul is called the free soul. And it's called the free soul because it comes from somewhere. It comes from the other world, they call it, down into the physical body that forms. It may come at birth. It could come at conception. Different Native American tribes had different timing on that. But there's those two souls. And at the time of death... The free soul can separate from the physical body, but because it's been sort of trapped in that physical body, it hangs around the physical body. And that is why they believe that the physical body needed to go through a process of get rid of the flesh. Uh, They would often cremate bodies. Very, very few Native American rituals involved maintaining the body and that was a belief and putting it in a tomb and they usually had all kinds of things in the tomb and that was in the hope that that physical body would remain for the free soul to later return and allow reincarnation that is why native americans had some mounds that have big stone chambers and tombs in them and they have the body laying out a lot of what you might think you'd see in ancient egypt and all kinds of artifacts around it for it to use because they believe that like a leader, a king, uh, a chief, a shaman might reincarnate in the future. But for most people, they were cremated. And the reason is to allow the free soul to get totally away from that physical body. So they would cremate it, put the ashes elsewhere, and that allowed the free soul to make a journey to the stars. That is all worked out. Uh, Andrew and I did a book together back in 2014 called Path of Souls. Uh, Graham Hancock used that book and referenced it in his uh, as he did the book Denise of an Origins. And we've got it in there, too, that story. But the soul makes a leap to Orion. It does it in the winter, generally the winter solstice. And, and it does it right before Orion sinks into the western horizon. It then goes under the underworld and comes up on the eastern horizon the next night. And then it would get out of what is Orion's nebula, which is Messier 42. And it would then hop to the Milky Way, move to the north and go to what we know today is the Cygnus constellation, probably the star Deneb which served as the North Pole Star about 16, 17,000 years ago. And from there, it went through an ogi or a portal to the other world, back to the back to wherever it came from. 
That's mm. the idea of the Path of Souls. Interesting. Yeah, I um, I really enjoyed that one. That's one of my favorite uh, of your books. I mean, Excellent. Denise Van Origins, great book. This was I, I really enjoy, I haven't gotten to Andrew's part yet, but I really enjoyed your part. I think it kind of encapsulates a lot of the stuff we talk about on this podcast too. So I really enjoyed it, and I thought that there was some new stuff in there that I haven't heard you talk about before that I really enjoyed as well. And the in the jump on the fact of the uh, the soul sticking around for a while after the flesh has deceased um when one of my good friends passed away i had uh, a couple of dreams within that first week that were quite vivid and uh just they just felt different than a normal dream where i saw him and talked to him and asked him questions about where he was and obviously he said i wouldn't understand but i don't know i think i i that that rings true to me because Maybe it was in my head, but at the same time, I've had dreams that feel like they're just dreams, but then I've had dreams that are more real than real, and uh, that would make a lot of sense if that, that is true. Yeah. Um, let me tell one quick story. I know we're running out of time here. Years ago, some years ago, my wife's mother died. Uh, she died at like 3 in the morning. Uh, she was in Missouri, New Madrid, Missouri. Uh, and I had come home that night to pick up some things and I was going to sleep here. My wife was at the hospital. So her mother died and they all then went to their her father's house in New Madrid. And she called me and woke me up and, and told me the things she needed me to pick up and bring up for the funeral and all. Mm -hmm. So I got in the car. It was around five in the morning. I got in the car and started on the ride up. And as I was driving, suddenly her mother appeared in front of me. And she was wearing this uh, blue veil and she, they were uh, very devout Catholics and she had a rosary on and she had the rosary beads and she had what appeared to be an angel on each side of me. Uh, and she said a couple things to me uh, very specifically about things she wanted me to do. And then at the very end, she said, and Greg, wake up. And suddenly I opened my eyes. I was driving on the interstate and had fallen asleep. Oh, geez. That's uh, astonishing. And the same time that occurred around the same time, we don't know it's exactly the same time, but same time frame within probably a half hour, if not exactly the same. Um, one of my wife's sisters saw her mother the same way in a hallway the same kind of outfit on with the rosary and so on. So yeah, that is, uh, that's one of the few stories I tell that I've had. That's really, uh, pretty impressive to me. Mm. Yeah. It's something that will stick with you for the rest of your life. I'm sure. Yeah. Wake up. And I, you <laughs> know, I, I remember that going, Oh my God. And I'm very, and I remember the exact, every time I drive by that place, uh, on the, on the interstate, I think about it just astonishing uh, mm. it probably saved my life i'm well i'm pretty sure it did yeah yeah i have one more question before we get out of here yes, sir. so um you discuss uh native american metaphysics and actually we've done a patreon with you in the past where you yeah. went through the whole native american metaphysics mm -hmm. and stuff as you know it uh but in the book you just describe the metaphysics and spiritual practices and then you go into how academia and archaeologists tend to dismiss this knowledge as purely mythological or fantastical with no relationship to reality, basically. You see the same thing with ancient Egypt and Sumer and all the ancient civilizations, basically. Uh, why do you think there is this culture um, of, of doing this? And, and don't you think that since we don't have all the answers, we don't know exactly what consciousness is, this is all, they're all just hedging their bets that everything's going to be explained away as some sort of physical mechanism in the future. So, I mean, like, why do you think they do this and why do you think that that's, uh, uh, well, the there's, a, there's, there's a couple of reasons. Uh, the one that is seldom talked about, it's kind of like, it goes back to, uh, the hatred that skeptics have for the idea that there may have been giants in the past. Uh, you can look that up, like go online and you'll see skeptics say there's no evidence, even though there's a lot of evidence of giants. Uh, that, And when I say giants, I don't mean people 50 feet tall. I mean, a lot of people that were seven, eight feet tall, maybe more. But anyway. And those people uh, exist today, too. You know, your modern yeah. day Shaquille O'Neal or Yao Ming or whoever. Yeah. 
Uh, we've talked about that. We've talked about that before when you were talking yes. about the Native American uh, situations with all that stuff. So I I think that skept, some skeptics are driven by an absolute hatred or disdain for anything religious, anything that points out that there may be a spiritual reality. Um, I I think that. I mean, I, I know that's true. I say I think that, and when I say I think it, I'm not guessing. I'm I'm certain uh, because I've read what some of them have written about it. They hate anything that might confirm like something in the Bible. You know, that one quote in the Bible, there were giants in the earth those days, and though they just attacked that over and over. Um, and they, they've shrunk down uh, Goliath. I've, I read a, a scientific article by a guy that said, oh, Goliath was probably 6'5 or something and had gigantism. And the reason he was beaten is because he was old and probably couldn't see anymore because of his gigantism. I think I've read, oh, I've seen that too, that article. I mean, it's ridiculous. So I, they ju- I think anything that supports uh, anything from the Bible or anything that's spiritual, you know, you got angels in the Bible, you have appearances of of lights in the Bible, people taken up in whirlwind and all that, anything that supports religion in any way or the spiritual world in any way they detest. And then there are some like Carl Sagan, uh, who actually, Carl Sagan would probably say most of it's hallucinatory, but I'm not sure it all is. If he were alive, I think that's what he'd say. Most of these events probably are hallucinatory, but I suspect it's probably not all that because we don't know everything. And there probably is something in physics, some other entity out there in physics that we just don't know about. Right. That it intrudes in our reality from time to time. Well, I wrote a blog too, connecting, talking about UFO tricksters and gods and goddesses. And uh, I equated it to the ancient Greek gods, the pantheon of gods. You had people that believed in the gods. These were real people. These controlled the water, the sky, the lightning, you know, all these different physical phenomena. Uh, The same thing could be happening. We See, I guess what it is, I think we give ourselves too much credit. We think we're so intelligent, we're so smart, we have it all figured out. We've got all the technology, all the science. We have the modern-day Akashic record with our phones. We know everything. But I don't think we do. And I think that the UFO thing, I think a lot of, you know, you have the people abandoning religions and now you don't have God of the gaps. You have aliens of the gaps. You have UFOs of the gaps. You have all this kind of stuff happening. Uh, So I think of those things in those terms, which there is some real phenomenon happening. We don't know what it is. And we try to mythologize it or explain it away the best that we can. But we can't because it's it's in at the end of the blog. I think I put that that's the point of these experiences is something doesn't want to be completely known for whatever reason. So either it's our own minds dangling this carrot uh, for some unknown evolutionary mechanism. Like that's how we push on or that's how we survive. We create these mysteries and then we solve them and we keep pushing it along like that. Or there is something physical. There is something external. There is something metaphysical uh, dangling the carrot for us, and it doesn't want to be known because if it did, it, it would present itself in a way that we could figure it out, basically. So, um, actually, I think it can't. I, I've said this too. It has no real form. It conforms itself. It has no underlying form itself. Hmm. Uh, that's like the Kachina mask or the clowns of the Zuni. Hmm. Uh, the whole idea of it is the clowns and the masks conceal what it really is and the reason they're not allowed to take those masks off you're not supposed to see what's behind the mask and that's exactly what john keel said about the phenomenon that it's the whole thing is is intended to conceal what's behind it but i think there is no form behind it because it it is an entity in and of itself it has its own intelligence whatever it is but it conforms its appearance and conforms what it does by interacting with whatever is going on with the percipient and whatever is going on with the culture at the time. But it has no true form itself. Just right. like energy has no true form, it basically can be solidified in the matter and it can change form, but it has no ultimate true form, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Well, there's a couple parts uh, in your part of the book that got me thinking because lately I've been pretty stern on sticking to the facts. I think all 
of these ideas, fringe topics, UFOs, entities, uh, gods, goddesses, heaven, hell, all these are things that have been experienced. All these metaphysics have been experienced in altered states of consciousness. Cause I can't, I've maybe had a couple synchronicities and weird experiences, but all of my truly mystical experiences have come from either psychedelic experiences, deep meditation experiences, um, and all those kinds of things. And what I find interesting about the psychedelic experiences, unless you're doing some serious smoking DMT or something, you can take psilocybin and walk around and interact with the world. Most other altered states of consciousness, near death experiences, you're basically dead. Uh, you know, um, meditation, you have to sit still pretty much close your eyes and, you know, chant or be quiet or whatever you're going to do. So like th that, those are the interesting. So I think that most of these things that we talk about in from ancient times and these ideas and these seeds that have been planted in our mind and our psyche are all experiences are real, but they come from these altered states of consciousness. Now your book kind of started to shift me away from that. So maybe there's some other weird things that can happen outside of that. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It just got me thinking in, in those terms because I've been pretty, pretty stuck to that idea lately. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I do think there's something out there. Uh, it's not what most people think it is, and it never shows its true form. But its form that it does show relates specifically to whoever is witnessing it. Hmm. Interesting. There you go. Yeah. Well, let's end it there. Uh, I'll, we're gonna we got to work on something else. I mean, maybe Doctor. Greg might be in the documentary. Maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, go check out Origins of the Gods. You can I have the link down below to Inner Traditions. You can download the audio book or you can go on Amazon. Uh, the 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 Kindle and ebook version will be out. You said on what? What, what did you say? Kindle. Kindle is out May uh, April 19th. April 19th. Uh, it's not just Kindle. It's everything else, too. All the ebooks. Uh, and Yep, and May 10th is when the um, paper version is available, May 10th. Awesome. And uh, if you're looking for a book on ancient American mounds or Native American mounds, I think he's got the best one out there, illustrations, great depictions, everything. Uh, you can click on that Amazon link down below and find that there, but that's a great book. And we actually, the last episode we did with you, I think we, we, we you did the slideshow for us with all the Native American mounds, and then we did a Patreon segment with that too. Um, yeah, we've done – we did the Native American mounds episode with you last time. Uh, we did the UFO episode where we just talked about UFOs. We did Edgar Casey uh, episode, and we did uh, Denise of an Origin. So this is our wow. fifth yeah. episode with you. Now. Time flies, that's for sure. Yes, it does. Yes, um, it does. But yeah, I want to thank you for coming on and sharing your uh, research and your your experiences and everything. And um, look forward to reading the rest of it and Andrew's part. And uh, I'll definitely get a hard copy when it comes out uh, there as well. And uh, yeah, uh, we're not going to do a Patreon because we're going to we got to do something else with them here. But uh, if you're interested, we do have three Patreon episodes with Dr. Gregory. You can go to our Patreon at patreon.com slash podcast for just $2 a month. You'll get exclusive guest episodes and segments. Tons of stuff on there. Dr. Gregory, Randall Carlson, Rick Strassman, you name it, it's on there. Go check it out. Uh, also, find us on Discord. Come chat on Discord. Uh, somebody's asking Audible version. Yes, the Audible version, Paula, is available right now. You can go check that out right now that's i've that's how i was able to uh listen to uh dr greg's book so far so go check that out uh if you're interested in merch we got some cool designs there we are living breathing magic with anubis holding our logo i these are all my illustrations i designed that uh, mind escape portal one too and then of course the the perfect uh, hashtag let Maurice speak silhouette shirt <laughs> go grab that this goes up uh, late this guy's a real bum uh, um, go to uh, indrasweb.org. It is live again. I we are that is going to be in the app store soon. So stay tuned for that. I will let you know. Sign up, set up a profile, and once it's live in the app stores, I will let everybody know. 
And again, congratulations to the winner of the Mind Escape t-shirt, Tom Hickey. I will send you an email. We'll get you squared away with that. I am going to take the names, uh, again, for the people that uh, entered to win this last month. I will re-enter you to win next month. And if anybody else wants to enter to win, all you have to do is go to Apple, Spotify, or uh, Google Podcast, leave a five-star review, take a screenshot of it, and email it to mindescapepodcast at gmail.com. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that's it. We are going to wrap it up here. Congratulations uh, on the new book. Congratulations awesome. on the new book. And uh, look Thank forward. Thank you, guys. You're always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Well, right back at you, You're welcome man. back on anytime, and uh, we appreciate everything you're doing. Just keep doing it, and we look forward to any future endeavors you have, including, you know, again, you might be, mm-hmm. you know, in this documentary, yeah. so I don't know. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, we love everybody. Stay safe out there, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Peace. Peace.